So now to set the scene for today, over 15 million cancelled appointments since March 2020 in the UK alone. And this figure is predicted to escalate. This is such a concern, as sadly there are so many people currently waiting treatment and have gone without merely or or undiagnosed. And obviously there are many oral health concerns. And for the purpose of today, we are going to be focusing on dentine hypersensitivity. So how is patients dentine hypersensitivity currently managed? The management of it is based on the research and clinical case observations, and we will be discussing how Biomin is proving to help manage dentine hypersensitivity this evening. So moving on to our panelists, I have the pleasure of being accompanied by a hugely impressive group of panelists today with extensive biographies, all of which are fully accessible on the Biomin website events page. But without further ado, here is a short introduction of our eminent panelists in the order in which they will appear this evening. So firstly, we have Dr. David Gillam, an internationally regarded expert and author in the field of dentine hypersensitivity and a university clinical reader and industry specialist. David began his career as a hygienist. Secondly, Ms. Donna Patton, board member of the International Federation of Dental Hygienists and immediate former president of the Irish Dental Hygienist Association. Donna is a very experienced practicing dental hygienist in Ireland. Thirdly, Ms. Gitana Redrian, president of the Lithuanian Dental Hygienist Association and a leading practical dental oral hygienist based in Kurnus, Lithuania. Gitana is also a distributor of oral health products in the Baltics. Then, Ms. Jill Wallace Cliff who is a renowned UK-based practicing dental hygienist with over 20 years of clinical experience. Jill has a passion for periodontology as well as caring for nervous patients. And finally, Dr. Stefano Daniele, a practicing dentist and university tutor based in Milan, Italy, with a specific interest and in research and a background in dentine hypersensitivity. Stefano was also a past visiting professor in dental materials and restorative dentistry. So firstly, we have a poll that we would like you all to participate in. And the question is, what percentage of the public do you feel suffer from dentine hypersensitivity? So please, Vote now. We're going to now move on to our first panelist, um, Dr. David Gillam. So the overriding arch of why we do what we do as dental professionals is to improve quality of life. And we certainly do not wish to have a negative impact on their quality of life. We know periodontal treatment and lifestyle, etc., can cause dentine hypersensitivity. So thinking about dentine hypersensitivity in the broadest sense of the patient's perspective, it's largely understood that 30 to 40% of the public suffer from dentine hypersensitivity. But according to our results today, um, the poll state, each one of you who voted that maybe you think that 60% of the public suffer from dentine hypersensitivity. So David, what do you believe is the biggest challenging in managing dentine hypersensitivity from the clinician's perspective first? Thank you, Victoria. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just looking at that poll, um, it, does reflect what uh, some of the um, 
studies show, and it will depend on whether we get the information from the clinical perspective or from questionnaires. Um, one of the best studies I've seen on a questionnaire was in 1995 by Dutch colleagues, where they said one in 10% um, of individuals will suffer from dentine hypersensitivity. And that's been borne out by uh, various uh, recent reviews. Um, but the problem is, is that I think it depends where you get your information from. So if you're in a clinical environment in general dental practice, you will actually get a lower percentage of your patients having sensitivity. I think one of the problems is that um, the, generally it's the patient who offers the information that they have a problem. So that means if a, the dentist or clinician doesn't ask the question, then they're not going to get the answer. So I think that's first and foremost, very important that, that clinicians diagnose the problem by asking questions, but also listening to the patient. Um, and I think if we do that, it will help. Now, one of the problems for uh, clinicians is that a lot of clinicians feel that dentine hypersensitivity is a nuisance problem. Um, generally speaking, uh, it's transient. Uh, it uh, relies on cold mainly. Um, so, and also I think most patients will not even attend the, the dentist because they think it's quite low risk compared to uh, toothache and uh, appearance worries. I think sensitivity is probably about the third um, most common um, reason why people come to see the dentist. So I hope that sets the scene uh, to your first question. Yeah, thank you, David. And what do you think is the biggest challenge in managing dentine hypersensitivity from the patient's perspective? Well, um, again, uh, I think you alluded to this uh, when you started about the problem with COVID. There are many obstacles or barriers to dental um, care. And if you look at a lot of the records um, and research, you're talking about 50% of the patients do not attend uh, a dentist for various reasons. Um, as I alluded to, very often, uh, because a number of people think sensitivity is quite mild in nature, they often self-treat and don't attend um, a dental practice. What I think we have to be aware of is that it does have an impact on the quality of life. Now, when we have done previous uh, questionnaire studies with dentists, most dentists seem to um, think it's a mild to moderate and, and they put it quite low down in their list of priorities. Uh, and I think also they find it very difficult to diagnose the problem. Um, when we asked hygienists to uh, do it, they had a better understanding of the impact on the quality of life. Um, I think the quality of life actually uh, of patients is underrated. Uh, more recently, uh, people from Sheffield and Bristol have done um, some very good work on quality of life issues. But in the past, um, it has been poor. And uh, when I used to do the questionnaires and clinical studies, we simply asked patients about four questions about what affects them on their day-to-day -day living. And in that way, you can get um, an idea of what they can, are concerned about. The one thing which often is for forgotten, if you give a patient cold water, when you ask them to rinse out, they may get sensitivity. And I'm not suggesting that you use that as a diagnostic um, uh, tool. No. And what do you feel the real impact then is? You mentioned about quality of life, but quality of life is from dentine hypersensitivity. I think there is an impact. As I said, most um, clinicians view it as mild to moderate. Um, most patients, I think, uh, can cope. Um, we all have uh, stories of patients who will tell you that they have a sensitive tooth and they will drink um, on the other side of, the, uh, of their mouth. Um, one uh, study which actually suggested that um, 
patients will um, not, as I say, not attend a dentist, but they will use various products, uh, toothpaste products, um, to um, uh, treat themselves. Um, I, I think you've got the slide up there. Um, basically, uh, we rely on open tubules um, and fluid dynamics. In order to have open tubules, you have to have um, tooth surface loss or recession. So going to the dentist may actually impact on this. When we scale and debride, we may actually be causing some um, damage over time. Um, patients using uh, acidic drinks, brushing, um, following drinking, these type of things may also have an impact on the quality of life. Yeah. Um, you have an extensive background in dentin hypersensitivity. How did you get involved with Robert Hill to overcome the problems of dentin hypersensitivity? Okay, well, historically, um, I've worked in a number of uh, places in university and industry. I came to um, Queen Mary in 2009 and a chance meeting internally um, with, I think it was after a dental uh, fair, um, and uh, we started chatting and that went on for an hour and a half. And we found that we had a lot in common. I, ha I had... Uh, a background of clinical testing and also I, I was initially involved in the original bioglass toothpaste but before that as a periodontist I was using um, perioglass some of uh, those who are older might be aware it was perioglass was a bioactive glass which was used for a um, bone def uh, bone filler um, and I noticed there that the uh, the particle size were very small. So I started um, experimenting with it on the basis of my experiments and work uh, through projects at the Eastman Dental Hospital in London. We were put in contact with the original company that developed um, uh, bioactive glass toothpaste, which was without, without fluoride at that time. Um, uh, and that became Novamin. And then that was obviously sold on to GSK. But through uh, postgraduate projects, um, Robert and I have developed um, the bioactive glasses. And um, so Robert's got an extensive knowledge of dental materials and also um, uh, bioactive glass in particular. So between us, uh, and I have to say thanks to our uh, undergraduate and postgraduate um, students, we am amassed a lot of research, but mainly in the laboratory. Uh, we were fortunate when we initiated the company with um, Richard, Richard Watley. Um, we then were in contact with uh, people who could formulate the toothpaste and, and develop that way. Um, so I think of what I have to say, um, one man or one per woman or um, doesn't resolve these type of problems. It requires a team. And we, were, we are very grateful for all those who collaborate um, with us in the, um, in the development. And from a clinical perspective, what I've enjoyed is that working with Robert is that we thought of, uh, of a concept and we were able to develop that um, into a, an actual fact. So I often say we went from uh, concept to consumer and as a clinician, uh, one who's worked in research and also in industry, it's quite fulfilling to actually um, have a product which we've developed that is actually out and helping patients. Um, as most of you will know, a lot of products never ever get out of the research phase and they're never seen in the clinical environment. So I think about 5% of all research um, actually is successful, which is quite challenging. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what would you say are the top five considerations when managing dentine hypersensitivity? Well, um, I would suggest that um, both from the patient and the clinician, there's um, education for the dentist that they need to be aware of how to diagnose um, 
the, the problem, uh, when to uh, monitor it and treat it, um, and to be sensible when you treat it. If someone has mild to moderate uh, generalized sensitivity, for example, you can use an over-the-counter toothpaste, uh, um, which would be perfectly suitable. If it's localized and severe, you may need to use more invasive um, materials. Um, you can use a varnish, for example, um, and it may end up leading with a glass onomer or so on. So from the dentist, uh, it's important that they manage it and monitor it. And there must be, I would suggest, a feedback loop that if your initial diagnosis or your differential diagnosis is wrong or uh, your treatment doesn't work, you need a way back to re-diagnose at that time. Uh, I know it's difficult in uh, practice to actually um, spend a lot of time monitoring, but there are ways of monitoring within your time frame. So it's important from a clinician to have that management strategy. For the, the patient from the ed educational point of view, we need to change behavior. We need to get them to um, take ownership of their own um, mouth. And um, that would mean, for example, looking at diet, um, looking at brushing habits. For example, if they have a problem if you see that they have a problem as a condition that they are brushing incorrectly or causing them damage, then I would suggest you can change that and get them to um, modify their technique. So I think from an educational point of view, that's uh, very uh, key. Um, there are simple ways of uh, diagnosing uh, the, um, the problem. If you have a patient who comes in, for example, the diagnostic challenge uh, is that we have a range of um, uh, clinical conditions which have similar um, symptoms. But generally speaking, if you blow cold air on the, uh, the tooth in question or teeth, um, you will get an initial response and that pain or discomfort should go. If, it per if it's persistent, then I think you need to look at something else. Um, a simple way of doing that is asking the patient to rate the, the pain following the cold air um, on a one to 10 scale or a verbal scale. Um, and then you can assess it that way. A simple tip, which um, you can use, you could um, check the, the score of the, the tooth to start with, and then apply a varnish or toothpaste or desensitizing paste. Um, and then after a few minutes, try again. And if if there's no pain or it's resolved, then um, you may be reasonably assured that the, uh, the problem is, is dentine sensitivity. What I would say in the challenge is that it's very easy for clinicians to just give a tube of toothpaste or polish the teeth and send the patient away. That in itself is of no use um, if you don't change the problems that cause sensitivity in the first place. So if there's any etiological or predisposing features um, which have caused the sensitivity, then you need to resolve these. As I say, it's simply not good enough to actually um, send them away um, because you're busy um, uh, with a, a, a toothpaste. So I think um, educationally, um, both from the uh, clinician's point of view and also from the uh, dentist's point of view. With quality of life, again, I think um, you, the patients will need to know what's causing the, their discomfort and um, trying to work around um, their diet, for example. For example, if you are a cyclist, you are going to um, or, uh, use a lot of uh, high sugar uh, products throughout your cycling, and that could have an impact on um, sensitivity. And obviously if you do it over a long period of time, as we know from some of the surveys of that, the high uh, proficient athletes, their dental caries rate is poor. Um, mm. I think uh, what I would also suggest, if I may, is that there's a tendency to treat each patient uh, in, in general. And 
um, what I would say that um, it's important to realize that there's no such thing as um, one glove fits all. Every patient is an individual. They have individual needs. They have individual concerns. I think it's important within the scope of our practice to recognize that. And it may well be that um, uh, there may be a number of products that you might have to use in combination over the counter with um, in office or professionally applied um, uh, products to help. So the challenge is, is don't um, concentrate on one and think that that is going to be the panacea for all, all um, treatments. So I think that's very important. Um, to the preventive aspects of um, dentistry is very key here and it's, it's a package, but please remember that uh, patients are individual. Um, I think I, I will start with one more, is that does the uh, dentist have the confidence to treat dentine sensitivity? And studies have shown uh, throughout the world uh, um, that uh, most dentists and clinicians appear not to have uh, confidence. So I think webinars like this where we can distribute uh, inf up-to-date information and oh. give practical uh, ex tips will, may help clinicians um, gain confidence in yeah. the, uh, um, the man treatment and management of denting the hypersensitivity. So I yeah. hope that helps. Thank you, David, absolutely. Thank you very much. So we're now going to move on to our next poll um, before moving on to our next panelists. So each one of you in the audience, from your clinical experience, what do you believe to be the critical age that suffers from dentine hypersensitivity the most? So please take your votes. Right, so we're now going to be moving on to our next panelist who is Donna and um, who will give her clinical input on the management of dentine hypersensitivity with her Irish patients. Um, but firstly, John, what are your thoughts on the results to this poll? Yeah, I would say that would be quite, um, that's what I would think as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I'd have to agree as well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I know, Johnny, you've been recommending Biomin for a couple of years and you set up your own website to make it available to your patients whilst in lockdown. So what drove you to set this up when you did? Well, thank you and hello, everybody. Um, previous to COVID, you know, in January, February, I was working six full clinical days. So during our two-month lockdown in Ireland from March to May, I had so much time on my hands, I got a little bit creative. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm very passionate about promoting oral health and visiting the dental hygienist. So I decided to set up a professional Facebook page, you know, other than my own private one and um, a website. So patients could gain, you know, look for information. And um, I had a shop with all the products that I would normally recommend as well. During the first lockdown, when we were all out of our daily routines, you know, we, we didn't have work to get up to get ready to go to work. Kids were off school, people were working from home. Even myself, I have to admit that I was sleeping longer in the morning. I took longer to have my breakfast. Some mornings I never got dressed or showered until 11 o'clock, you know. So it just got me thinking it was time to reach out and, and try to be a dental motivator and get everybody back on track. And so, the, you know, for the Facebook and the, the website, this gave me a little platform to try and get the message out there, you know? So that's yeah. what, why I did it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and how do you communicate dentine hypersensitivity with your patients, Donna? 
Well, when a patient comes in and, you know, you maybe start cleaning the teeth and they're squirming in the chair or they maybe tell you that they have sensitive teeth, you know, beforehand. Um, obviously, once you've determined why they've got sensitivity, do they have gum recession? Have they got exposed root surfaces? Are they brushing too hard? Have they got toothbrush abrasion? I would show the patient any obvious damage. I would explain the cause and any changes to their, their hygiene habits, their, you modify their technique, go over that with them. By using a mouth mirror in the clinic, that's what I always do when I have you know, a problem that I want to explain to the patient, I always hold them, show the mirror, and then we would talk about where their problem is and why they have the problem, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, then obviously David, um, spoke about the hydrodynamic theory that's the that's the theory that I always kind of use when I'm trying to explain to the patients and um, on the Bioman website there's a, a picture of the, um, the open tubules which I use I actually keep that up on the the computer on a tab I think Judith might um, have my picture there yeah I keep this on my computer and it's easy then to explain to the patients that the the tooth when it's sensitive has the open tubules and with use of the biomin um, you know the, the the magnified image there shows the exposed root surface which shows the tubules on the dentine surface I use this image from the biomin website which shows how the bio active glass fills up and narrows the tubules and then eventually occludes them. This is because the, the particles are smaller in the biomin and it has the binding property as well. I explain that the, pro, the exposed um, surface is covered with the bioglass, which will stop any stimuli reaching the nerve endings within the tubules. So basically showing this image, it's self-explanatory, I think. The patients understand it really easily and they accept the problem then, they accept why they're having pain, they accept that um, you know, the use of this toothpaste will improve their, their sensitivity. They, they can understand how it works then. Yeah. So, yeah. And um, I, you briefly mentioned it now, how you explain the benefits of biomins to your patients. Um, do you have any examples of case studies of how it has improved patients' oral health? Yes, I've, two, I've got quite a lot, but just two or three from the top of my head. Um, first one, we had a 13-year-old boy who had fixed ortho, who he was quite non-compliant with his oral hygiene, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> he just wasn't cleaning his teeth. And um, he was kind of an inherited patient from an orthodontist who sent them to us. His um, He started to show some signs of, you know, hypermineralization round about the the brackets, some chalkiness and chalky patches, and they started to kind of flake. So we got quite concerned and we explained to mum, look, you have to keep these teeth much cleaner. We went over all the cleaning routine with him, but we got him on the biome as well. And we reviewed for maybe in about a four weeks, three, four weeks time, we reviewed the boy again. And it was quite interesting because the chalkiness had disappeared. It was much more of a glassier surface. Um, so, I mean, obviously they had remineralized and we got him, we kept him on the biome and throughout his whole ortho. And luckily when the ortho was removed, there was no lasting damage to the enamel. Um, so that was one, one thing that really sticks in my mind. And, and I've got every patient on, on with ortho now on biome and I just make sure they use it just to be on the safe side. The other one's quite interesting. Um, we had a lady who bought a tube of biomin. She bought it for herself and then she also bought one for her friend who was undergoing some chemo who had a very sore mouth. And I remember the dentist explaining that it would also help um, with the sore mouth through cancer treatments. And then this same lady who was in hospital um, phoned the practice and asked if we could send more biomin to the hospital for her because it really helped. Now I think the bioactive glass um, sticks to the soft tissues as well and it helps to lubricate the mouth so possibly this was helping to alleviate some of the discomfort in our mouth um, yeah so these, these are two examples but there's many more most patients just really think it works for their sensitivity and once they try it they always want to buy more you know so I have no problem trying to explain or, or 
you know, once they've tried it, they know it works. <laughs> sure. And just out of interest, Donna, what demographics of patients do you treat um, predominantly and recommend biomin for? Well, actually, I, I, I see all demographics. I, I work in three practices. Two of them are general. One of them is a kind of multi-specialist practice where we see ortho implants, perio patients. Um, so yeah, I see all demographics and I would encourage nearly everyone to use Biomin because of the remineralizing action um, with the optimal low dose of fluoride delivery over the longer period of time. Surely this is a huge advantage in what I personally would want from a toothpaste. Obviously there's more specific groups that you would definitely recommend it to, patients with sensitivity, patients with hypermineralization children, poor diets, high, you know, maybe um, high carriage rates, athletes, as um, David explained there. Mm. In Ireland as well, there's quite a lot of people in rural areas that have no fluoride in the water. We have well water in Ireland, and I see this quite a lot. Um, kids that come in and their enamels just, it's really poor quality. So we have all the, the patients in Ireland in our practice that have well water using Biomin. Um, anybody that has that needs TLC for their enamel, I think, but it's a great toothpaste and I, I use it myself. Well, thank you so much, Donna. Thank you. So interesting to hear your background and as well in treating the patients and who it works for. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So now audience, we have another poll for you. And the question is for each one of you during the pandemic, to what extent has your patient's oral health been compromised? The poll will come up very shortly. Please take your votes. All right, so um, now we're going to be moving on to Gatana, a leading hygienist from Lithuania. So we've all gone through so many changes, Gatana, in the during the pandemic, and many lifestyle changes have affected our oral health, ranging from dietary changes to varying stresses. And what are the most common observations that you've witnessed um, where oral health has been affected? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I think pandemics was really huge stress to all of us and for our patients. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Yeah. I can hear okay. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it was really a huge stress for most of us and, and for our teeth as well, I think. Uh, actually, a few of my colleagues from Netherlands recently published an article about patient self-care uh, for oral hygiene uh, during pandemics. And what we can see in this publication that patient really uh, had just a bit decline in, in, in their dental hygiene and their uh, uh, you know, daily oral hygiene. Because most of us stayed at home, had more snacks, more comforting food, more carbs, fizzy drinks, coffee. As Donna mentioned before, we as in usually we have our coffee in five minutes, but in pandemics we could spend one hour drinking one cup of coffee, chatting on Zoom and so on. So we can imagine that our oral health had some, uh, you know, threats and, and for enable, it wasn't the best time because of so much sugary drinks, so much chocolates and, and stress as well, because as we all know, stress really works very hard on our uh, oral health as well. And, you know, more tooth grinding, more stressful. So this all affects our oral health and our patient's oral health. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if you saw the results to the, um, to the poll there, um, which was quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, I saw, but that's what I mentioned that yeah. our all results are really very in compliance with what I saw in the publication of my colleagues from <laughs> Netherlands. Yes. <laughs> so, 
you've spoken about in our conversations about an autumnal diet and how that impacts sensitivity. And personally, I think this is an extremely interesting observation. Can you please expand on this? Uh, yeah, because usually uh, in autumn, I, I get some questions from my patients uh, because all patients know that it's so healthy to eat more fruits, more berries. But as uh, we all know, fruits and berries besides uh, carbohydrates also have some acid. And sometimes patients, for example, if they have some sour apples, yeah, not those from supermarket, but from their own gardens, they experience a more sensitivity. Maybe sometimes they do not have uh, sensitivity in regular days, but in autumn where they have more berries, uh, when they have more fruits, more acid fruits, they feel this um, uh, tooth sensitivity. And uh, we also, what we notice that uh, some patients are coming, they try to, put, uh, to have more smoothies in their diets. Yes, more acid drinks. They, people think smoothies are really very healthy. They are, but on the other hand, it's, it's not so healthy food for, for our teeth if we have the smoothie for one hour. I mean, like all, all our enamel will be like put into the acid. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, those diet, uh, uh, autumn diet can be threat for, for, for tooth sensitivity as, as well. And that's why I get really a lot of questions from my patients in autumn. N not so many like in spring or summer, but more in autumn that they feel from, from, from their fruit or berries. Yeah, that's interesting thing to, for us all to be considering about the, the time of year. So as a practicing hygienist and a distributor of oral health products, what considerations do you take into account before recommending a product in both roles? I would not say that I take into, into consideration in different roles when I'm distributor or when I'm hygienist, because uh, uh, as a hygienist, I always will focus on the problems of the patients. So I will ask what they are using now we look at their problems and then we try together to find solution. And me as a specialist, I'm always, uh, you know, very keen to, to give something new, something innovative, something scientifically proven. And as a distributor, I have a, a really freedom to choose which products I can bring to, to, to my market. So I always, uh, focus all on the same thing. It should be in innovative. It should be scientifically proven. It should be somehow unique, not on the market yet. So, uh, it, it, so that's what is really important for, for, for me as a hygienist, as a distributor. Yeah, thank you. And you market Biomin for dentine hypersensitivity as a distributor. <clears throat> What about periodontal patients? What do you recommend for periodontal patients? Oh, yes, this is really a very good question because this is the question I sometimes get from my colleagues because they are asking me, uh, okay, I, I, I like uh, Biomin toothpaste. I, I use it for some remineralization for uh, sensitive tooth, but what, what, what could I recommend for periodontal patients? But I always uh, uh, tell that we should take into account that periodontal patients uh, very often uh, suffer from the dentin hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because of the gum reduction and uh, we, they really have this problem and because of the gum recession, uh, they experience not only tooth sensitivity, but they also, their, their tooth uh, uh, tissue are also in, in danger. So 
I, I, I really like to recommend them biomin. So I'm sure that their tooth surface will be protected against acid attacks, not just uh, only tooth sensitivity. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Gitana. Thank you. Thank you. So now audience, we have another poll for you. So get ready to vote. How successfully do you feel you are able to manage dentine hypersensitivity for your patients? Please take your votes now. We are now going to move on to Jill and her extensive clinical experience in general practice um, has been recommending Biomin since 2016. So Jill, you speak about the science of Biomin being so compelling. How do you convey this to your patients? Hi, good evening to everybody. And uh, thank you for this. And thank you to TRICARE and Richard Watley for uh, for um, asking me to uh, convey some of my experience. Um, yeah, I mean, with regard to the science of everything, there's been so many other products out there um, and discovering Biomin by chance in 2016, um, the evidence has been quite compelling and supporting. Um, it's been one of the best discoveries. Who, who kind of knew that a, a, a bone substitute within Bioglass could be optimized within toothpaste um, and dissolving quite quickly uh, in order to sort of increase the pH of the mouth, which is then kind of helping against the hypersensitivity, um, occluding the dentinal tubules and providing some relief for patients with hypersensitivity, mm -hmm. um, protecting for anything up to 12 hours um, against this acid attack and helping encourage remineralization um, there's a lot of science to talk about this and it's kind of not, you know, I understand a lot of the science, but science, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, my patients don't understand too much science. So when I'm actually conveying this to them, I, I generally talk about it as a smart glass and a smart toothpaste. And it's very specific, very special in a dental practice. It's not readily available within supermarkets. And I think that, you know, that, that supports our profession and our professionalism. Um, and I explained to them, you know, it's, it's, it, once we've optimized and once we've actually worked out what the, uh, the causes of the hypersensitivity are, we can, we can then suggest the toothpaste going forward. So, you know, we, we talk about sort of acid and acid attacks and diet and so many other different things that both mm. Donna has been talking about and David was saying about patient individuality, which I'm passionate about. You, you have to treat everybody as an individual and you have to assess everybody as an individual. So that, that's how I convey everything in my very Yorkshire way. So thank you. And yeah, everybody is so individual, aren't they? Um, yeah. And can I ask you now, um, Jill, what attracted you to introduce Biomin into your practice for your patients? Oh, well... You see, for, for, for 20 odd years, I've been treating this lovely lady called Denise and her family. Denise actually works for TRICARE in the admin department, I think. And she came along with this tube of toothpaste that had been sent by a rep, a lovely rep called Claire Nichols, who works for TRICARE, and said, try this. And I thought, hmm, not something else to try. But my mother is rather wonderful that she's got smoking related periodontitis with extensive toothbrush abrasion because as we all know our family members don't listen to us and she's got extensive recession and extensive sensitivity and they don't listen and I said yeah well try this so she's not having any of that so she goes away and then the next thing is hmm, it's not bad that toothpaste is it and so we, I kind of think oh well wow we're staggered she's a very thoughtful Yorkshire woman and we kind of decided that I'd look into the science of it, which was quite compelling and wonderful. Um, you know, and, and, and our, our patients, as you, as you know, they are much more focused now. So moving on from my mum, we decided to start looking into it for our patients. 
And, um, you know, patients are much more health focused. They're, they're much more into diet and smoothies are taking over the world and causing extensive hypersensitivity. Um, processed foods, we've got sugar in processed foods, altering the pH of the mouth. And the demographics of some of my patients obviously come from lower social economic groups and not necessarily have the right education or not necessarily have the right access to, to, to adequate care. And so, you know, to recommend a product that's going to actually work really well um, and cover every more angles than, than possible, you know, I mean, it's great. It's, it's been a great thing. Yeah. Well, no, thank you for sharing that. So since you've been recommending Biomin for so long, can you please now explain how some of your patients have really benefited? And can you share some examples, apart from your mum? <laughs> I'm very similar to Donna, actually. You know, the examples that, you know, without sort of repeating what Donna said, my experience is extremely similar to Donna. And you, you, you look at, um, you know, sort of patients that have this, generally non carious sort of tooth surface loss you're looking at erosion attrition abrasion bruxism many of these things together you know and you know separately we could we could talk about um individual remedies we we look at altering the diet we look at sort of identifying what's actually causing these problems but with the biomin f it's kind of covering all bases um before we used to have to work out what the problem was with erosion with abrasion we we alter the toothbrushing um you know we we alter sort of the diet and um, and i find certainly with a lot of with a lot of the diet stuff that i'm talking about you know the dietitians are telling them to eat five five pieces of fruit and veg a day and and to graze so when does the mouth get to neutralize um and so we we do need a product that's going to support that and i i kind of believe that this this does you know, once we've identified what the problem is with these patients, um, you know, certainly with erosion seems to be on the increase. You, the younger the younger people are, are probably having a lot more um, fruit ciders. Um, some of us of a certain age are having more Prosecco. Um, and in, in my opinion, it's um, it, it's been revolutionary in trying to sort of help these patients with, with the by introducing the biomin and we've seen some really good results it's all anecdotal obviously because it comes down to experience and i'm sure donna and gita and everybody will say the same thing it's it's you know a long a long time of experience the same for yourself um perio is the bulk of what we do so in my practice so we've seen increasing increasing recession increasing tb abrasion um and before we used to say that teeth were poor and hopeless and we kind of give them more of a guarded prognosis. So these teeth are lasting a lot longer and therefore we're seeing an increase in hypersensitivity and biomain has just been fantastic to, to support that. So moving forward, um, you know, I, I don't know about, I don't know about everybody else as clinicians, but xerostomia seems to be quite much more prevalent and we see many more patients with multi-medical multi-medication I would say and just as just sort of as a as an adjunct I'm seeing a lot more patients on antidepressants and as we know that SSRIs will cause a serious amount of xerostomia not huge but a little bit and so we need some sort of buffering action that Biomin F is going to give us um, changing and helping support uh, increasing the pH, giving a more longitudinal support with the pH. I mean, just giving you some stats, there were, there's about 7.3 million people currently on SSRIs. That's 17% of the population with a possible xerostomia and possible hypersensitivity. You know, I could, you could go on. We're all clinicians on, on this, on this uh, webinar tonight, and we've all had lots of experience with what's happening and it's it's you know it's looking at oncology we actually see we're actually treating more oncology patients actually in general practice with the effects of the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy um, and biomin is supporting that and it's something that really i would encourage clinicians to actually stock in their practice because it's not on the prescribers list mm -hmm. so i think you know giving patients access to it is is phenomenal really Mm. Um, 
could yeah. go on. I, no, I couldn't <laughs> agree more. <laughs> no, I know. It's so interesting as well, hearing everybody's input and experience on that. And everybody's different in the way that they communicate things. How do you communicate and identi- identify dentine hypersensitivity with your patients? Well, I, I have um, a, a friend of mine and I have a, a lovely, lovely question that we kind of pose when they first come in. And we generally say, um, how are you managing to keep your health mouthy, uh, your, your mouth healthy or your health mouthy even? <laughs> um, and and so they, they will either say what they say or the, their eyes will go up and left and, and the rest of it. And then say, well, are you having any bleeding? Uh, are you suffering from any uh, sensitivity, any pain, any discomfort? And at that point, it's our job to try and identify where the uh, potential hypersensitivity problems are coming from. So, you know, I mean, traditionally, you know, we, we to, you know, traditionally we, we were limited. We had to try and establish what the cause was and then try and fit a product to go with that cause. So, you know, there's, there's Novamin that, David was talking about which was uh, in a certain product that was targeted for erosion and then you're looking at high caries rates so we were then using a different product and you know this Biomin F which is fantastic um, covers all those bases does it not I think it does Um, and so you know the evidence base is there We're, we're fulfilling and fitting all demographics across the board this product will do that, um, you know, and so professionally, the way that I feel about it is that we, um, we've got a product here that we can stock, support, support as a professional product. Um, we use it topically for our patients who are uh, whitening their teeth. We use it topically after we've yeah. removed any, any um, uh, protein, layer um so yeah it's 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 great yeah thank you so much jill i could waffle on you know i could waffle on (laughs) (laughs) well it's been a pleasure having you on as a panelist thank you thank you and now audience it is time for yet another poll so get ready we would be interested um to understand if you would be interested in participating in any practice-based clinical research project on dentine hypersensitivity. So please take your vote, yes or no, or not at this time. We are now going to moving on to move on to our last panelist for this evening, um, Stefano. So Stefano, um, thank you for joining us this evening. And my first question that I'm going to pose to you this evening, having been involved in lots of research, what has been the greatest challenge in your research into dentine hypersensitivity? Okay, good evening to all and uh, thanks to Victoria to, to have introduced me. Um, unfortunately, the time I'll be able for my question question and answer session is very limited to the, this evening, so I took some note of, uh, of my laptop. I apologize for that. Um, well, my personal experience in dental hypersensitivity started in um, uh, 2004 when I did my Master of Science uh, uh, thesis about this topic. I undertook a, a full review about uh, etiology, pathogenesis, and at home uh, and at office products to relieve dental hypersensitivity pain, um, to evocative stimuli, uh, above all uh, beverage and food, and there too. Um, over the next year, I suggested to my patient many, many at uh, over uh, the counter products for the management of that hypersensitivity, and uh, above all, uh, uh, many toothpaste specifically designed to relieve uh, sensitivity. Uh, we know that uh, dentine hypersensitivity toothpaste uh, using uh, use a different strategy to obtain uh, uh, sensitive relief, uh, uh, such as a potassium nitrate based formulation. That, that are designed to block the A-delta nerve response to stimuli. 
and uh, however uh, potassium nitrate based uh, toothpaste uh, um, in the scientific literature uh, indicate that uh, are rarely able to penetrate deeply into the, the, the um, into the tubule, and uh, clinical results are very are very um, inconsistent. An alternative approach is uh, to attempt to uh, occlude the dented uh, tubes, uh, typically using, uh, for example, fluid salt. In, in practice, this, this therapy often only result in, in temporary relief uh, from dental hypersensitivity because the dented uh, tubes are not uh, really permanently occluded by it. Uh, but, uh, mm, this strategy provides a thin mineral uh, su such as uh, calcium fluoride or carbonate salt smear layer that covers exposed dentin. This, this thin smear layer, as we know, uh, is very unstable and um, susceptible to acid challenge such, uh, uh, such uh, as posed by carbonate or soft drink, or orange, grape juice, wine, uh, etc. I can say that in my clinic experience, until, until I discovered Biomin F, I did not find any over-the-counter uh, oil, uh, oil hygiene products uh, such as to pass of my wash, uh, able to consistently relieve uh, um, the pain of dental hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. And what did you observe when you started using Biomin? Well, I, I, I met uh, Richard Watley in November 2018, and uh, he proposed me to try some uh, tubes of uh, Biomin F uh, to test for my clinical management of the anti hypersensitivity. I decided to, to try this new treatment uh, concept because uh, uh, of my interest in uh, bioactive uh, uh, technology uh, contained into Biomin F to test. Before our meeting, I had uh, studied the, the features and uh, the biological activity of uh, bioglass in uh, tooth oil mineralization, uh, mineralization. And so I found this uh, opportunity um, very exciting for me. I can say that my first patient was my sister-in-law and uh, who had uh, suffered from extensive dental hypersensitivity for many years and for, uh, and for whom uh, I could provide no solution for, for, for her and for all other my patients. Mm, my sister-in-law in less than uh, two weeks um, confirmed uh, to me that uh, her dental hypersensitivity has, had uh, reduced uh, um, considerably. This, uh, this result uh, has, uh, um, after a man is stable, uh, even after a very strong uh, acid challenge from um, vomiting uh, episodes. And this indicated to me that uh, mineral produ produced from, from, um, uh, from biomin F in dental uh, tubules are very strong acid resistant. I like to mention that this mineral, uh, this mineral phase uh, made by biomin F uh, is a flow apatite uh, and not uh, an amorphous uh, mineral layer, uh, such uh, for example uh, uh, the, 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 the mineral layer produced uh, by, by fluoride uh, device, uh, high concentration fluoride device. And um, fluorapatite uh, is a uh, strong acid resistant uh, and, uh, and uh, biomin F uh, is able to pro pro produce it. Yeah. And what were the next steps you took in understanding your clinical observations from biomin? Yeah. Um, from uh, the, the, the great uh, result uh, obtained in my sister in law, I was very interested to evaluate uh, biomin F to test with four patients presenting extensive dental hypersensitivity and uh, substantiate my initial observation. The result uh, obtained with uh, this patient treated with the biomin F showed me that uh, the result uh, obtained with my sister in law, for example, uh, was not. Um, 
uh, one of uh, experience uh, and uh, that uh, the fluoride bioglass technology is very is very effective uh, when uh, when when the bioglass uh, are dead uh, on the toothpaste uh, uh, is exposed to our fluids. Mm -hmm. And what were your findings from your practice-based clinical research, Stefano? Uh, well, uh, after the first, uh, the first patients uh, uh, that uh, I poured the optimal result in the pain relief of the, the anti-hypersensitivity, I wanted to engage uh, um, with other Italian DESI, I had hygienist colleagues, uh, uh, the use uh, of biominefric test. A dear friend uh, of mine and colleague, um, call it uh, Dr. Andrea Alessandri, helped to me to recruit a, 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 a quite a, a high number of the patients uh, suffering from documented identity hypersensitivity and evaluate uh, uh, biominefric toothpaste. I can say that after a few months, uh, we collected 29 patients, uh, recall, uh, and the uh, evaluation of uh, the identity hypersensitivity. Then uh, we, we published the results of the pilot uh, clinical study in a dental uh, tribunes uh, prevention uh, number one 2020 journal, and uh, which was uh, distributed in uh, print and online uh, to uh, Europe. The data, I'd like to, 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 to show uh, you uh, some data uh, of this clinical trial in, the, um, in, this in this slide. Yeah, okay. So I know you've been looking um, for, for clinicians to become involved in your current practice um, based clinical research. What would you need from the participants who may wish to get involved in your research? Yes, um, I'd like to, 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 to engage uh, more dentists, hygienists in the use of biominef to pest uh, for treating dental hypersensitivity clinical situation and stand uh, up on the, the patient base uh, original uh, pilot study that uh, I said before. Um, I would like uh, them to select a suitable patient and collect the data after um, um, uh, two weeks or twice daily application of toothpaste. And um, it's not important uh, if uh, the, the, the participant uh, um, uh, comes to, to, to university or public clinic, uh, it's important uh, collectively uh, get uh, more data as it possible and produce a multi scientific publication with a large number of, of the patients. Yeah, okay. And um, obviously we saw the slides uh, or everyone that was involved in the poll. Um, there were quite a number of people that may be interested in getting involved in the research. And for those of, the, of you who do and who are involved in providing results of the patients, you will receive um, a box of eight tubes of toothpaste. So um, I've now got one final poll for you all. So if you're ready for this last question now, um, the question is, do you believe teledentistry has a role in future oral health care? And you've got the options there, so please take your votes now. Thank you to everyone who's been participating in the votes this evening. The answer is, oh, definitely. We've got that as the strongest at 42%. So thank you so much for um, all in being involved and participating in the polls. So I'm now going to pass um, the questions over to Richard, as Richard's going to be asking some questions to our panelists that he's received from yourselves in the audience this evening. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Victoria. Uh, it's been a very interesting uh, discussions from all the panelists. First question we've got, um, is it possible to restore the original enamel thickness in tooth surfaces treated with phosphoric acid solution um, uh, uh, during orthodontic treatment? 
I wonder who would like to answer that question. Is that, uh, David, what, do you, what would you believe? The original enamel thickness is going a bit far, but could it be improved? It depends what the um, questioner is actually asking here. Um, you use phosphoric acid uh, simply to etch the, um, the surface um, with a view of uh, putting adhesive in. Um, once the adhesive is in, it blocks the tubules anyway. Um, I think we've got to be very careful when we um, look at these products. You know, they're not miracle workers. <laughs> Um, and I think we've got to be sensible here. You know, phosphoric acid um, uh, will etch the, um, the enamel, um, but you can uh, you remineralize the enamel, um, but that's only surface. If you have a cavitated lesion, I think you can forget it. Does that help? I think so, uh, David. I think that's uh, uh, that. That's fine. That was from Giovanni who asked us that question. Okay, yes, Giovanni that was, needs any further uh, information um, uh, to discuss that directly with you. Uh, 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 Carrie, uh, Carrie Jackson has asked, in what form uh, does um, uh, biomin come? In other words, toothpaste, mouth at the moment is purely as a uh, as a toothpaste. We are looking at a, a, a professional gel in the coming months. I think that answers that question. And um, is it to be used as a, a normal toothpaste or left on the tooth for a set time? Um, David, could you pass a comment on how it could be used? Well, as you, as you know, that um, this is about prescribed use. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, the clinical tr studies have shown that we can brush with it twice a day. And I think um, that, that is all we can really say. As clinicians, we're always quite inventive and it could well be you could leave it on the, the teeth overnight, but until we get clinical studies to show that it, it works, then I would be very guarded um, to say um, any more on that topic. Okay, uh, I've got a, uh, a question from Anka is saying, is uh, Biomin uh, SLS free? Now, I think Victoria, you did quite, uh, the answer is it, it has got SLS, but Victoria, you did some research into this onto SLS when you were writing up an article recently. Would you like to ask comments so I can? <laughs> I'm more than happy to. Um, yeah, I, essentially, it does have SLS in it. It was interesting. I um, posed a question through social media um, amongst um, clinicians, asking them of what the most important things and considerations that they consider are the most important when deciding on recommending a toothpaste in general. And the answer came back that the majority firstly think is the, does the toothpaste have SLS in it or not? Um, and then I looked into this further and um, it seems that um, yeah, it's a common question and a, a common thought that comes to people's minds if a, a toothpaste does contain SLS because of the thought association with it causing ulcers. But if you look actually into the evidence, um, there's actually not really any strong evidence to state that SLS does cause abscess ulcers. And then if you look into it further, um, SLS is a surfactant. Um, correct, Richard, and you can um, support me, I'm sure, in this further. Most toothpaste, in fact, the majority. All toothpaste have, have, have a surfactant. But they may be called something differently. Um, so it comes down to it. Is, what is the surfactant? And should we be maybe thinking no to SLS when you look at the evidence? And please, each one of you, go away and look at the evidence supporting the correlation and, and, and the association with SLS causing ulcers. But it was just an interesting, um, interesting result because it's one thing and I know can myself. I yeah. Yeah. Can I add to this? It's Jill. Yeah, can I add to this? Because in, in clinical practice, when we're looking at this, if you've got somebody that's got, say, like like plainness, which is what, what we're talking about here, and which is where the initial um, 
SLS free thing started from relief, flipping it on its head rather than saying that it's going to cause something, which, you know, the evidence is there, what you were saying, Victoria, it, 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 it's kind of you would you would avoid or uh, you would then at that point uh, look at your patient and if they are actually having problems with like complainers or say for instance ulcers there's a potential then you weedle it out you you kind of do it backwards where you won't actually say no have no toothpaste whatsoever with SLS freeing it it's the, it's flipping it the other way around you you have to assess that patient individually and 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 you know let them try it let them see how you how you manage with it if they if it's causing irritant if it's causing discomfort then suggest something now sls free in it that, mm. that's the way that i look at it personally yeah and oh. so i guess looking at the the picture as a whole as david was speaking yeah. about everybody has and you know what could be the trigger is it really pointing at like the SLS I think, or not. I think SLS has got a very bad reputation but mm. it's not necessarily any better or any worse than any other surfactant that's in uh, in toothpaste mm. the great thing about why do we choose SLS the great thing about SLS is that it's uh, it's tasteless you can't taste it the problem with most of the other surfactants is they affect the flavor of the toothpaste and the flavor of the toothpaste uh, life is always a common compromise. Uh, but if you get the flavor wrong of a toothpaste, nobody's ever going to use that. And I think one of the great successes we've had with Biomin is the flavor has been very much accepted by the majority of, uh, of um, uh, patients or, or consumers of the product. I think in, in summer of this evening, I feel that you know, with everybody's experience and case studies that they've presented, that Biomin certainly has a place um, in treating dentine hypersensitivity, I can't talk now, dentine hypersensitivity in a huge way and has um, a key role to play for us in managing this with our patients. But not only that as well in, in um, remineralization as well. So um, sadly, we've come to the end of the unique format of having a panel um, on a webinar today. And I'm sure you will all agree that the panelists have shared a broad view on the topic of dentine hypersensitivity and have given us all a great deal to think about. Um, and on behalf of Biomin, I'd like to thank each and every one of each of you panelists um, for providing um, your expertise today.